This video is on parametric surfaces. Now we've already investigated surfaces quite a bit in our Calc 3 course. And we've seen that they've come in really two different types of flavors. One of the flavors is the z equals f of x, y form, or when we had our functions of two variables. And essentially this is where we had z on one side and we were able to get all the x's and y's on the other side of our equation. So for example, z equals 2x minus 3y plus 6 would describe a plane as a function of two variables. The other types of surfaces that we've looked at, and this was more prevalent at the end of chapter 12, was when we had the x's, the y's, and the z's all together on the same side of our equation, which means that we would also have some sort of constant on the other side. So for example, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 9 would be our sphere of radius 3 in, well, R3. And again, we have the x's, y's, and z's all on one side, and, it, and it's just the more standard way that we write this. What we need to start talking about, though, is how I can parameterize our surfaces, because what we're going to be investigating in our next section is going to be what are called surface integrals, which is where we take our surface in three space, and we need to take every single ordered triple, or every single point on that surface, given as an x, y, z point, and plug it into some function and then sum over what are called patches. And we'll talk about patches a little bit later in this video. But the main idea is that when we do surface integrals, our surface integral is going to be a double integral, which means I am only allowed to have two variables or two parameters to evaluate this integral, right? It's a double integral, so only two parameters, two variables, except Every ordered pair is going to be given as x, y, and z, which is already too many variables to begin with. So we're going to need to parameterize so that we can somehow write our surfaces in terms of just two variables. And so that is really what we're doing when we're trying to parameterize our surfaces. Somehow take our surface, no matter how it's written, and try to parameterize it as a vector function of just two variables, or a vector function of just two parameters. And the nice part is this is very, very similar to how we originally started talking about vector functions to describe space curves where, well, we tried to come up with component functions for our x component, y component, and z component. And that's going to be the same exact strategy here. When we do parametric surfaces, our component functions in the i hat, j hat, and k hat direction are going to be functions of two variables. Now, we generalize that using the variables u and v, although I'm going to be honest, typically we don't actually use the variables u and v. These are really just our kind of our dummy variables, um, our placeholders, and we're going to choose those two variables depending upon the type of surface and, and what would make the most sense for our parameterization. But for a parametric surface, Again, we're going to generalize with u's and v's. And so you're going to see most of the formulas are in terms of u's and v's, even though the examples well, are not. And so that also helps us make our distinction between whether we're talking about a vector function that describes a curve, which should be r of t, or a vector function that describes a surface, which should be r of u and v. All right, so let's take a look at some examples. The first example, let's go back to that example of the plane z equals 2x minus 3y plus 6. Now, this is already given in that z equals f of xy form. This is given as a function of two variables, and luckily, anytime we're given a function of two variables, our parameterization is going to be very, very easy. And again, luckily, this will probably constitute about half of the examples that we look at in Calc 3. So again, the idea here is that I need to come up with functions for x, y, and z that only use two variables. And in this case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the same variables x and y. So I'm going to define x to be defined as x, y to be defined as y, which is, again, very straightforward. And how are we going to do every single function of this form where it's a function of two variables? And then z, well, we know what z equals. z equals, in this case, the equation of my plane, 2x minus 3y plus 6. The key feature is that each of my component functions, x, y, and z, are only defined in terms of these two variables, x's and y's. You can kind of clearly see that on that right-hand side of each of those equations, 
we're only using the variables x and y. And so now I'm going to color code these to make it a little bit easier to see, at least in the beginning. We take each of these component functions, and just like we did with our parametric equations being transformed into vector function equations, we're basically just going to match up each of these components for my i hat, j hat, and k hat directions. So my vector function, r, and now again, r is going to be a function of just the variables x and y. Well, my i hat component is just x, right? x equals x. g hat component is y, y equals y. And my k hat component, which is normally z, well, I'm substituting in what my actual, well, surface would have would have been what the formula for my surface is and the key point here the most important idea to to keep in your mind when we're doing these parameterizations is that when we write it as this vector function we need to make sure that we're only using exactly two variables or two parameters for r all right let's take a look at another example let's say i have the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals four and i want to write this as a parametric surface now, it might seem like, well, I only have x's and y, so let's do the same exact strategy, except I want to be careful because this cylinder, right, x squared plus y squared equals 4, it's not written in that same form. Even though it's only x's and y's, it's not of that form z equals my function f of x, y. This is actually that other form where the x's, y's, and z's are all on the same side. It's just that, in this case, or well, z is going to be the same, right? What this looks like for every value of z is just going to be the same, right? The, the shape of this does not depend upon the variable z. It's going to look the same in, at every single value of z. And we've already talked about these cylinders a little bit. And again, I use technology to give us a, a nice little picture. But this is going to be the cylinder which is, again, it's going to be a circle of radius 2 if we project it into the xy plane, and it extends infinitely in that z direction. So we already kind of know what it looks like. And how am I going to parameterize this then? Well, typically, we're going to use cylindrical coordinates. You know, it's a cylinder. Shocking that we're going to use cylindrical coordinates, I know. But remember, when we use cylindrical coordinates, we use the variables r, theta, and z. But that's too many variables, right? I only am allowed to use two, two variables when I try to well, parameterize my surface. Now, luckily, we know that that radius is two, right? We know that our radius is actually going to be fixed, right? R is going to be two no matter what, which means that if that's fixed, that's constant. That means that the only actual variables when I parameterize this are going to be theta and z. And you're going to see this type of example where we want to take our surface and parameterize it in cylindrical coordinates. If we understand that surface, it's going to make life a lot easier because hopefully one of those variables is actually going to be a constant. Either r is constant, theta is constant, or z is constant. And that is going to give us a very nice way to kind of parameterize our surfaces. So how would I do that in this case? Well, we know our cylinder is x squared plus y squared equals 4. And we know how do I, well, how do I change variables? How do I do my change of variables into cylindrical coordinates? Well, x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, and z is z. Those are just our general definitions for converting to cylindrical coordinates. Now, like we said, though, that r is a constant, right? that r has got to be equal to 2. So we'll plug that in. And if I replace that r with a 2, hopefully we can see now that right-hand side of my equation only has thetas and z's, which means, well, there's my parameterization. That's how I'm going to parameterize this particular surface. I'm going to color code it one more time just to hopefully make sure we see where everything's getting plugged in. But just like we did before, I'm taking my three parametric equations and plugging it into my vector function. In this case, my vector function is a function of the two variables, theta and z. And when I plug those in for each component, 
hopefully we can still see that on that right hand side i only have the variables theta and z and again the x component function with i hat the y component function with j hat and the z component function with k hat now the next thing we're going to talk about is tangent planes and we've talked about planes quite a bit in this course we've actually revisited planes well this is at least the third time i believe and remember we define planes typically using their normal right the normal being a vector that is actually orthogonal to our plane in space and then our formula for finding any plane right not necessarily just the tangent plane this is just planes in general is that we take our normal and those components of my normal basically give me the coefficients in front of well this formula and again i kind of color coded uh, in case you needed a refresher where again the component of our normal vector uh, really scale the x y and, and z and then we have our given point now we've talked about this before again when we're given a tangent plane we're usually asked for the tangent plane at a point so we're going to be given the point the the question is how do i find that normal now again if you go back and you think back to sec chapter 12 and chapter 14 in both cases when we were talking about planes we know that normal is orthogonal and so what we really did was we found two vectors that lied on our plane and if i have two vectors that lie in my plane the cross product of those two vectors will give me my normal right the cross product of two vectors on my plane will give me a third orthogonal vector or a third normal vector to my tangent plane which is how i define this now when we talked about this in chapter 14 how do i find those two vectors that are going to lie on my tangent plane well, the easiest way to find two vectors that are going to be on my tangent plane are actually to find the tangent vectors. We're taking derivatives, right? We take the derivatives of, well, we can take actually two, any, any two directional derivatives that we want on our tangent plane and use those two to find my normal. But the two easiest directional derivatives are just going to be, well, typically in the direction of my variables, right? Let's not worry about actually calculating a whole directional derivative. Let's just do the two directional derivatives based on the variables of my problem. So what this means for a parametric surface is that again, if I'm given a parametric surface, and again, we're using our general variables, u and v, what I wanna do is find the partials with respect to those two variables or those parameters so again in this case my variables are u and v so i want to find the partial with respect to u the partial with respect to v i know that both of those partials must lie on my tangent plane so then the normal is going to be the result of taking the cross product of my two partials now quick definition we've talked about curves being smooth we can talk about surfaces being smooth and we say that a surface is smooth as long as the cross product of these two tangent vectors does not equal my zero vector. But let's do this in practice. So we're gonna look at the same two surfaces that we parameterized just a minute ago and figure out how I'd find the tangent plane at some point to those two surfaces. So looking at my original function, given the plane 2x minus 3y plus 6, and let's try to find what the tangent plane at the point 1, 2, 2 is going to be. Well, we already did the work to find our parameterization earlier, right? So I'm just going to take my parameterization that I found earlier and use that. Now I want to find my partials. So now in this case, my two variables or my two parameters are x and y. So I'm going to need to find the partial with respect to x and the partial with respect to y. Let's start with the partial with respect to x. Well, if I take the partial with respect to x, again, we're going to go component by component. So for my i hat component, well, what's the derivative of x with respect to x? Well, it's just going to be 1. When I look at my j hat component, what's the partial derivative of y with respect to x? Well, with respect to x, y is just going to be a constant, which means that partial is going to equal 0. And when I get to the k hat component, well, what's the partial with respect to x? Well, 2x becomes 2, but then the minus 3y and the 6 are both constants, so those go to 0, which means my partial with respect to x is just going to be 1i hat 
plus 0j hat plus 2k hat. Again, we just go component by component. Now, we need to find the partial with respect to y. Well, pause the video real quick, find that partial, and see if it matches my answer. Did you do it? Well, hopefully. But it's pretty straightforward, right? What's the partial of x with respect to y? 0. It's a constant. The partial of y with respect to y is 1. And then the equation for my plane, well, the only part that's not a constant is going to be that minus 3y, which is just going to be minus 3. Now that I found my two partials, I find the cross product of those two partials. So again, I'm not going to go through the process of finding the, the cross product. Again, there's the way the book does it, which is setting up all your minor matrices. Again, there are a bunch of other formulas as well. Um, some, some fairly elegant ways to do it, too. You know, feel free to Google or search YouTube or, you know, whatever way you're comfortable taking the cross product, take the cross product. But I'm not going to do that out in this video. All right, so I take the cross product of my two tangent vectors. I get my result. And I want to make a point here. Normally, when you find your partials, they're not going to be all numerical. There will typically be some sort of variables left. There will still be x's left or y's left. And so you can actually substitute for the given point before you calculate the cross product, which means that that way your, your tangent vectors are actually just numerical vectors, and hopefully the cross product will be a little bit easier. Uh, but it'll always basically follow this form. So again, we found our cross product, which was negative 2 i hat plus 3 j hat plus 1 k hat. We plug that into our formula for planes, right? We're now, again, those components become my, my normal components. So negative 2 is really that A, right, that first component. 3 is B, that second component. And 1 is C, that third component. And we just plug in our ordered pair as well. And my ordered pair was 1, 2, 2. So plug that in for the x1, y1, z1. And now we just want to basically distribute and clean this up. So again, take a minute. Go ahead, distribute everything. Clean it up. Combine those constants. If you did it, right, then unpause the video because I'm about to give you the answer. We should get negative 2x plus 3y plus z. And then we combine all of our constants, we get a negative 6. Now, if I solve this in terms of z, right, z equals f of xy, right, get the z on one side and everything else on the other side, I get z equals 2x minus 3y plus 6. Wait, does that sound familiar? No, hopefully it does. That's actually what we started with, right? That was the plane. Well, what's the tangent plane to a plane? It's itself, right? The, the plane is a plane. So the tangent plane is going to be itself. This obviously should have worked out exactly as the same tangent plane as the plane I was given. So, all right, let's try one that's actually maybe a little bit more interesting. So let's look at that other surface, our cylinder that we looked at earlier. And now let's find the tangent at the point 2, 0, 1. Again, let's use the work from earlier. We already found our parameterization a little bit earlier. Let's use that. But now let's calculate our partials. So the first partial now, again, my variables are going to be theta and z. So now my partials are going to be in terms of, well, theta and z. So our partial theta. And go through, we're going to take the derivative of each component one at a time with respect to well, each parameter or each variable. So going component by component, my first component is 2 cosine theta. So what's the derivative of 2 cosine theta with respect to theta? Well, 2 is a constant, but the derivative of cosine of theta is negative sine theta. So I'm going to get negative 2 sine theta in the i-hat direction plus and the derivative of sine is cosine, so plus 2 cosine theta in the j-hat direction. And then what's the derivative of z with respect to theta? Well, that's a constant, so the derivative is 0. So that first partial is going to be negative 2 sine theta i-hat plus 2 cosine theta j-hat plus 0 k-hat. Now let's take that partial with respect to z. And this one's actually going to be even easier because my first component... 2 cosine theta, what's the derivative of that with respect to z? Well, it's all a constant, so that's 0. What's the derivative of 2 sine theta? 0. And then what's the derivative of z with respect to z? 1. 
So my partial with respect to z is just going to be 0 i hat plus 0 j hat plus 1 k hat. Or that partial, and if it was in your textbook, would just be written as just k hat. Although, again, I would recommend that even when things become zeros, leave the zeros in for now. We're going to be doing cross products and you're going to want to keep track of each of the components. So I would highly recommend that you actually put the zeros in for now instead of just omitting them as your book might do. Um, although, of course, it's not wrong to omit them. Now we want to find the cross product, except, well, we're finding the tangent plane at a specific point. So, again, we could evaluate the partials at that point before I calculate the cross product. And this is kind of what I alluded to with that last example. If I want to do my cross product as just numerical vectors, I can actually go ahead and plug in and evaluate what those vectors are going to be numerically based on the, the point I'm evaluating with in my, well, tangent plane. Now, for this problem, I said that we want to find the tangent plane at the point 2, 0, 1. But again, that was in terms of x's, y's, and z's. That was before we parameterized our surface in terms of r's, thetas, and z's, which means I now need to actually convert this Cartesian point 2, 0, 1 into my parameters theta and z. Well, as we mentioned earlier, right, this surface is going to look the same for all values of z. So we're going to find theta from the projection into that x, y plane. And again, we time kind of mentioned earlier that that projection is just going to be a circle of radius 2. And so my point now would be here at the point 2, 0. Now, fairly obviously, if I want to figure out what theta is, I can see just by looking that theta must be 0. And I'm just going to roll with that. You could, of course, if it's not that obvious, go back to how you defined your parameterization, do a little bit of trig or a little bit of algebra, depending on how you parameterize and, and find out what theta is going to be. Um, and again, hopefully that's not the part that trips you up with these types of problems. Now, we also knew that converting from cylindrical means that, well, z equals z, right? We keep that constant. So theta equals 0 and z equals 1 for this point that we're given. So I want to find again that tangent plane at this point where theta is 0 and z is 1. r is also 2, but that was a constant and we kind of dealt with that already. So what this means is I'm going to evaluate the partials now when theta is 0 and z is 1. And we're going to see that this is going to make my problem even easier. Because if I plug in a 0 and a 1 here, well, my partial with respect to theta, negative 2 sine of 0, that's just 0. 2 cosine of 0, well, cosine of 0 is 1, so that's just 2. Then I had a 0, so no. Oh. So my vector, right, my vector evaluated at theta is 0, z is 1. For the partial of theta is just 0, 2, 0. The partial with respect to z, I don't even have to do anything because that was already 0, 0, 1. Um, but of course, you know, if you need to plug it in and evaluate and, and simplify. But again, the whole point is that I'm now getting my two vectors, right? I'm getting my two vectors so that they're just numerical. And the cross product of numerical vectors is, again, typically a bit easier. This one is actually easier than most because of all the zeros. There's so many zeros in this cross product that it becomes probably about the easiest one you'll compute all semester long. And so the result of this cross product is 2i hat plus 0j hat plus 0k hat. And again, you could just write that it's just 2i hat and leave off the rest. But again, at least in the beginning, I would recommend writing right in the zeros every time, right? Write in the zeros where you need them, even though they're they're not necessary, not, not necessary, seeing those invisible zeros will probably help. Now, this should also make sense in the context of this problem, right? We had this circle of radius 2. My point P was over there um, you know, at theta equals 0. My normal was 2i hat. Well, if I plot my normal vector at that point, it's just moving in the x direction, which should make sense. We know that a circle... Every time I have a circle, that normal vector points away from the center of that circle, right? Basically, um, you know, the tangent plane is going to be orthogonal, and we've talked about 
how with circles the tangents are always at right angles to the normal and again, i don't want to spend too much time going back to that but again hopefully the normal makes sense in the context of this picture which means now that i have the normal and i have my point i can plug everything into my tangent plane formula and again there's no need to convert the normal anymore that was in terms of i hat j hat k hat so even though we did everything in terms of the variables or parameters theta and z once i get to that normal i'm good it's just plug everything in but again i'm plugging in a whole bunch of zeros here and so distribute simplify and i mean i guess pause and calculate it if you need to but zeros make this pretty easy we're just going to be left with 2x minus 4 equals zero and again, I could simplify this because I am looking for a tangent plane. And this simplifies is just the plane x equals 2. Which again should hopefully make sense. This plane is only going to be defined in that x direction, which should, again should kind of make sense. Which means it's going to look the same for every single z value, which we already knew because it's a cylinder that looks the same for every single z value. And we also showed that that normal has no y component. So again, hopefully this all kind of makes sense. And visually, when I plot these two together on GeoGebra, well, x squared plus y squared equals 4 is my cylinder. There is my tangent plane x equals 2. And we can really see from the picture, and again, feel free to use GeoGebra so you can actually rotate this yourself and play around with it. But that tangent plane is just going to just touch my cylinder at that point, right? At that point, x equals 2. And so everything should make some sense here. Everything should hopefully be kind of falling into place as we evaluate our parametric surfaces. The last topic we're gonna to cover in this video is gonna be about surface area. What we wanna do when finding surface areas, well, basically given a parametric surface S, what is the surface area, right? How much area is on that surface in space over some region? That is gonna typically be defined um, as, as a region D. But what we're going to do is we're going to sum infinitely many infinitesimally small tangent planes called patches. So the tiny little tangent planes are going to be called patches in this case. And what we're going to make use of is this fact that we know that the magnitude of the cross product of two vectors is equal to the area of the parallelogram spanned by those two vectors. Right? This formula from way, way back in section 12.4. So what we're going to do to find the total surface area of our surface over some region D, we're going to sum parallelograms based on the partials, but then scaled by the change in their parameters, which is gonna be given by DA. So what this all means is that our surface area formula is that if I'm given a smooth parametric surface, defined as my typical vector function, but now a typical vector function of two variables, as long as S is covered just once in that region D, basically meaning as long as it doesn't fold back on itself, and as long as my surface doesn't actually fold back on itself, then I can find the surface area of that function over that region D well, using this formula. The surface area is just going to be the double integral over the region D, and we're going to be summing our tiny little, well, tangent plane patches, right? Although I really just need the the area of those parallelogram patches and scaled it by DA. This is our formula. Now, before we actually go into the examples, the special case here, when surfaces are actually given as a function of two variables, which will be about half of the time, we can actually work out all of the mathematics ahead of time and actually give ourselves a very nice formula to work with at the end. So we kind of talked about this as we went through the examples, but if I am given a function where z is given as a function of two variables, x and y, we can always parameterize that x is x, y is y, and z is that function of x and y. Then we have to find our partials. Now, again, this should be fairly straightforward. The partial with respect to x, well, what's x with respect to x? One. What's y with respect to x? Zero. And what's f with respect to x? Well, it's f partial x, right? It's just going to be whatever the, the partial of that function is with respect to x. Similarly, for the partial with respect to y, well, partial of x with respect to y is nothing. The partial of y with respect to y is 1. And then my 
function f, well, it's just going to be partial f in that k hat direction. Now we can find that cross product. And again, this cross product is not too bad because I got a lot of ones and zeros, which make life easier. And that cross product becomes negative partial x in the i hat direction, negative partial y in the j hat direction, and just one in the k hat direction. Now, I want you to make a special note of this equation. Kind of circle it because we're going to talk about this particular result again coming up. Because again, the cross product tells us our normal, right? And so as we start talking about surfaces and surface integrals, one of the concepts we're going to have to be conscious of is how I determine orientation of my surface, especially in three dimensions, and what it means to be normal. And this formula right here is going to help us determine what our normal is. And normal is going to be very, very important with surface integrals. Because again, we're going to need to determine the orientation, and orientation is going to be based on our normal. So make a special note of this equation right there, because we will be coming back to revisit it a little bit later. But for what we're doing now with surface area, I just need the magnitude of that cross product. So I'm squaring each of those components, but again, the negatives don't matter, right? If I square a negative, it becomes positive. So I'm going to get the partial with respect to x squared plus the partial with respect to y squared plus... Well, one square is just one, all under my square root. Which means when I plug that into my surface area formula, my surface area formula is just going to be the double integral over the region D of well, that square root of the sum of the partial squared plus one and then DA. And notice that this should look kind of familiar because this is very similar to the arc length formula that we've looked at before. And hopefully, again, that kind of makes sense, right? Arc length and surface area are two related concepts, right? We're measuring either how much distance a curve traverses or how much space a surface traverses. Well, again, it's the same type of question, just in an extra dimension. So that similarity should, well, hopefully be a little intuitive. So let's actually look at our examples. Let's go back to our same surfaces that we've looked at throughout the video. So we'll start off with that plane. So let's say I want to find the surface area of my plane over a rectangle given by, uh, well, this, from 0 to 1, cross 2 to 4. Now remember, when we're looking at regions defined by rectangles, that first thing in brackets, those are my intervals for x's. So I'm basically saying for x's between 0 and 1, or from 0 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 1, that second set of brackets are for my y's. So y between two and four, or from two less than or equal to y, less than or equal to four. Now, since we are given our surface in that convenient form where it's z equals my function of two variables, we're gonna use that surface area formula that we had just derived. So what this means is, again, given my function, right? And if I'm given any function of two variables where z equals that f of xy, we're going to calculate the partials. And again, this is about as easy as a partial as we can calculate. What's the partial with respect to x? Well, two, the rest of its constants. What's the partial with respect to y? Well, negative three, the rest of its constants. Then we just plug it into our formula, all right? And in this case, again, there's no variables left, which is kind of nice. So 2 squared plus negative 3 squared plus 1 is just going to be the square root of 14. And, well, the square root of 14, is that a constant? Well, of course it is. And any constant, I can factor outside my limits of integration. So my surface area is just going to be the square root of 14. And then the double integral over that region D, dA. But wait a minute. This is my constant function, isn't it? Right? If everything factors out of my integrand, this is the constant function. And if we remember back from chapter 14, or 15 actually, when I am integrating the constant function, if I have a double integral over my constant function, that's just going to be the area of my region D of 14 times the area of my region D. Well, my area was just a rectangle where the x side was length 1, right, from 0 to 1. The y side was length 2 from 2 to 4. So my rectangle just says a size of 2, right, or an area of 2. And so my surface area is 2 root 
14. And yeah, that's basically it with this one. Now again, with this example, there were no variables left, so you may have to actually you know, calculate an integral here using your integration techniques if there are variables left over there. But again, for a constant function, we can use that nice trick where I can just, well, find the area of that region instead. Now let's look at the other surface area. So, or the surface area of my other surface, x squared plus y squared equals four, that cylinder. Uh, except now I need to bound myself. So I'm gonna bound myself between uh, one and two in the z direction. And again, we've completed most of the work for this problem already. We have our parameterization, which again, I'm just taking from earlier. We found our partials earlier as well. So the partial with respect to theta and the partial with respect to z. So again, I can just pull those from our previous, well, our previous work. And now I have to find their cross product. Now I can't plug anything in here. I'm gonna have to actually calculate this cross product using all the variables. Again, this one's not too bad because well, there's a ton of zeros. So my cross product here is two cosine theta in the i hat direction, plus two sine theta in the j hat direction, plus zero in the k hat direction. And again, pause the video, calculate the cross product yourself and make sure you get the same result I did. And again, I wanna just make a giant note for summing over that entire region. There isn't anything you can plug in here. So again, you're gonna to have to calculate these in terms of those variables and those parameters. But what we really need is gonna be the magnitude of this cross product. So squaring each of those components and then summing them, well, two cosine theta quantity squared is four cosine squared, two sine, theta quantity squared is four sine squared theta. Zero squared is not gonna change anything. And oh, I see a cosine squared and a sine squared. Bet you I can factor those out, right? So factor the four, and what's cosine squared plus sine squared? One, it's our most important trig identity of them all. So I really just end up with the square root of four, which is two. So we plug that into our formula now. And again, this one becomes kind of easy. I'm plugging it in and my region D. So again, my variables here, right? were Z and theta. And so my bounds for theta are from zero to two pi. Again, we're going around the entire circle. My bounds for Z, and that was part of the problem. My bounds for Z are just going from one to two. And then that magnitude of the cross product was just two. And again, kind of a coincidence here. And then evaluating that, that double integral, we should end up with the result four pi. Now, what's nice is that this actually makes sense intuitively as well, because if I have a cylinder, right, and again, a finite cylinder where Z is between one and two, or you know, my Z distance is just a distance of one, if I unfold my cylinder, I get a rectangle. Hey, practice this yourself. Take a sheet of paper and fold your sheet of paper into a cylinder. You can do it really easily, right? So unfolding a cylinder is really, well, creating a rectangle where one of the edges is actually that circumference, right? The unfolded edge becomes your circumference. And so we talked about what the circle was, right? The circle of radius two. Well, circumference is pi times the diameter. Well, if the radius is two, the diameter is four. So that side of my rectangle is four pi. My length, right, z only changed by one. So the height of that rectangle is just one. And so again, my surface area hopefully makes sense kind of geometrically as well. Now, admittedly, some of your homework problems are gonna be a little bit harder than this. And the most challenging part of this section is typically just trying to figure out how to set up the parameterizations and really what is the problem describing? So what I would suggest, because again, it's gonna take a while to, to become comfortable with this idea, is use technology. Use that GeoGebra grapher and actually graph the surfaces that the problem is giving you and try to understand that region first. And if you understand the surfaces in the region, that should hopefully help quite a bit. And actually it'll make this online part of Calc 3 probably better than it would have been if we were actually in a classroom because you can use that technology on every single example. Use that technology, see what you're looking at, and then, then try the parameterizations. We're basically gonna be using these parameterizations and this idea for the rest of the semester 
So the more you practice it, the more comfortable you'll get. And admittedly, if you're having trouble with the homework now, that is understandable. That is going to happen. It's going to take a while to understand this. So don't get too frustrated. And this isn't going to be one of those things where you should do all the homework before you move on. Because when we move to that next section, we start doing surface integrals, and we're going to see these parameterizations in action and, and being applied that will help you gain some intuition and some understanding of what we're doing with the parameterizations. And it's all going to kind of tie in together. And I promise the more you keep looking at this, the more you expose yourself to this. And again, it's going to be intimidating and it might be a little overwhelming at first looking at these homework questions and, and just, first of all, trying to understand what the question's asking you to do. But the more you look at this, the more you expose yourself, if you can spend a little bit of time each night just kind of re reviewing each of these topics little by little, it is going to make a huge, huge difference there at the end. And so it's not a bad thing to leave some homework problems blank in the section and then move on to the next section. But then make sure you cycle back. Make sure you come back and, and look at those problems again after you've had a little bit more exposure and a little bit more comfortability with it with this whole idea of parameterizing our surfaces. Otherwise, let me know if you have any questions and good luck. And one last thing too, when we do substitute for dA, if we had substituted with the variables r and theta, meaning if I kept z constant with my cylindrical coordinates, just remember, when we make that substitution, we're using that Jacobian and dA gets substituted with r dr d theta. So make a note of that because that's going to come up in your homework too. All right, good luck.